there's something to learn from everyone, including teenagers. And today you're in for a treat. You're going to hear from nine emerging inventors slash entrepreneurs. These aren't your typical high school students sitting in their STEM classes, obviously bored. No, they've combined their individual superpowers to develop a wearable technology. It involves electrical sensors to detect signs of heat-related stress. Don't worry, you'll hear all about it from them. Hi, I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre, and nothing makes me happier than seeing young, bright minds coming together to solve some of the world's most prevalent problems. These 10th and 11th graders are directly applying concepts from their STEM classes to perfect their product. And they've even co-founded a business as part of their process to legally protect their invention. If you've been sitting on an idea and not quite sure how to legally protect it or build a business around it, then this might be just the motivation you need to get started. This is season 10, episode 128. Let's start the show. Hi there. This season, we are doing live workflow consultations. And for the first time ever, we are joined by a fairly large group of budding entrepreneurs slash inventors. And they are here. They are students at what's the name of the school, Rachna? Uh, it's Arizona College Prep Erie. It's uh, one of the public schools in Chandler Unified School District. Okay, well, I am super excited about this episode. And that was Rachna Nath that you just heard. And if her voice sounds familiar, it's because she's a friend to the show. She was on the season, she was on season 10, and she came on to talk specifically about strategies and a process that she was working through as she was preparing her students for the pandemic, teaching them and educating them through this pandemic that we're still in the midst of, unfortunately. Now, we definitely want to talk about what, why the students are here. But first, Rachna, I was wondering if we could first talk a little bit more with you first. Tell us about this wonderful STEM program that you are a part of, that you are teaching at your school. So, uh, Alicia, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, always a great, amazing time with you. Last time, this time too. And as a friend, as a host, anything uh, goes but... Um, thank you again. And a little bit about me. I, I'm just a high school teacher, 9 to 12. I teach 9 to 12. And um, I started this program. I call it Dribble. So it's Dream Research Innovate Project Based Learning. Um, and I know that project based learning is very different from what regular courses are done because PBL does not have uh, quizzes or tests or assessments as such, it's just project based. But I wanted to give my students a little bit more than just do project-based learning. And that's when I, uh, by chance, got into a grant writing opportunity from Lemels and MIT. And that was a grant for $10,000 for an innovative idea to a real world problem. And that's how I meet, met with this, these kids two, almost two years back now. And we wrote a grant to the, the foundation, Lemels and MIT Foundation. And um, since then, it's always something or the other. I mean, always another grant opportunities to write for and Drupal goes on. So it's always, and I have had a, a lot of people, a lot of groups apply for patents, provisional patents, um, and carry their projects forward, even, now, even if they have not gotten the grant that they had apply, applied for. So the motivation is basically to take a project from an idea to a product, um, in however many years they can get it done in. So, yeah. And how long have you all been working together, this particular group, the Sense Hydro group? How long have you all been working together? Has it been a year, maybe two years? It's, it's been over a year now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so what grade is everyone in? Are you all in the same grade or? <laughs> they started off as um, all freshmen, and uh, sophomores, and now they are sophomores and juniors because ah, of okay. So, yeah. okay, awesome, awesome. Well, well, thank you for letting us know first a little bit more about the program because now let's get into this Sense Hydro group, and it's a group of nine inventors and entrepreneurs, and their company is Sense Hydro. They have invented the Hydro Hat. 
And so let's start off before we get into what your invention actually is, and you're going to walk us through the the process that you went through for actually filing for your patent, because that's going to be very helpful for so many of our listeners. But I'd first like for each of you, one by one, to introduce yourselves. And as you introduce yourself, also tell us what your superpower is. So Sahani, shall we start with you? Sure. Um, so my name is Sahani Sandhu. I am a current junior at Arizona College Prep. And I'd say my superpower is, is just being focused and keeping everyone focused. Um, we're all teenagers and at times we can get a bit distracted, but <laughs> I'm usually the one that gets everyone back on track and I um, make sure that everyone's um, working on everything to get us where we are today. So, Awesome. Who wants to go next? Alex, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Alex. Um, I am a 10th grader at Arizona College Prep. And I would say my superpower is kind of like being able to communicate with everybody and relating to everybody a little bit so that I can kind of like understand where everyone's uh, at and how they're uh, feeling and working. That is so important in business, life, and in all aspects and facets of life as well as business. So, Caitlin, you're up next. Hello, I'm Caitlin Lay, and I'm a junior at Arizona College Prep. And I would say that my superpower would be just being organized, being attentive to detail to make sure we hit all those check boxes on all of our, I guess, grants we apply to. Awesome, Abe? Uh, my name is Abe Troop. I am a junior at Arizona College Prep, and I would say that my superpower is probably being responsible and doing uh, exactly what I was, uh, whatever I said I would do uh, in the group. Got it. That's that's great. Omina. Hi, I'm Omina Namatoba. I'm a junior at Arizona College Prep, and I would say my superpower is prioritizing and making sure that. We get whatever we're focused on at that current moment done as quickly as possible. That's great. And Dia, is it Dia or did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, it's Dia. Dia. So my name is Dia Nath and I'm a 10th grader at ACP Erie and I'm basically a researcher um, in the team and my superpower I think is just keeping the mood light and making sure like work time is still fun but still serious. That's awesome. Yeah, we can't have all work and no play, right? <laughs> Jacob, what about you? Uh, my name is Jacob Kaufman Warner, and I am a sophomore at Arizona College Prep Erie. And I would say my superpower is numbers because I deal with uh, financials and the budgeting and balancing products and how it'll take to make things. So I'm in charge of that stuff. Awesome. And Daniel? Uh, I'm Daniel Wu. I'm a sophomore at uh, Arizona College Prep, and I guess I would say my superpower is uh, working on the electronics and making sure it works. Awesome. And last, I think we have Neilan. Uh, my name is Neilan. I also go to Arizona College Prep. I'm a sophomore. I would say my superpower would be to know the science behind anything that I have a question for, because I've always really liked science. Well, awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Now, let's get into your actual invention, which is the Hydro Hat. So do you have an official spokesperson for your group who can tell us more about what the Hydro Hat is? Sure. So um, I can go ahead and explain it a bit. Okay. Uh, so basically, the Hydro Hat is a wearable device that we created um, that detects and prevents heat stress um, using the uh, wearer's vitals, um, so such as um, their heart rate, pulse, temperature, all of those um, good stuff. So it uses those and it, um, it puts that through a um, system that we created that basically um, uses that information and warns the user in case they are um, close to getting heat stress or heat stroke. Um, it can be adapted to multiple forms. So um, right now we're working on the hat, but it can also be adapted to rings or anklets or any sort of wearable 
um, that mm -hmm. an individual would want to use. That's interesting. So when you filed this patent application, is it for the hat itself? And is that, applic is that application written in a manner to be ex expanded or to include other types of wearable technologies? Definitely. So for a majority of the patent, we focused on the hat aspect since that's what we are prototyping right now. But near the bottom of the um, actual application, we there is a section called embodiments, other embodiments. And that's basically where you just list out any other possible ways you could use technology you created in other forms. So that would be the rings or the anklets or any other thing that we wanted to create. We just listed it down, th down there so it'd be protected in the future. Okay, awesome. Well, let's let's go ahead and take a look at your website. And if you could tell me what the URL is so that I can make sure I go there. What's the website? Um, the website is sensehydro.weebly.com. Okay, since hydro, whoops. dot weebly dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. And that was Omina, everyone. Okay, so we're at the Sense Hydro website. And again, that's sensehydro.weebly, which is W E E B L Y.com. So cool looking website. Who designed the website? Um, it was a um, group effort with Neelan, Daniel, Sohani, and I. Um, and once the basics were done, um, Sohani and I went into um, make it more user-friendly and for our information to be more easily available. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind, walk me walk us through the website first. So I'm just gonna slowly scroll, scroll on the page and I want you to just tell me a little bit about what we're seeing here on the website. Uh, Alicia, um, before, before we move forward, I actually wanted to give a credit to the logo design that was created by the little siblings of Jacob Warner. So Jacob, do you want to say a quick something about how you guys ended up with that uh, logo design? Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank my uh, younger siblings, uh, specifically Emma Kaufman, where I think we settled on her design of the logo. Well, that's pretty cool. How is, is this your sister or younger brother? Uh, my younger sister, but kind of okay. all of my three younger siblings work together. Really? To and how, mm -hmm. how old are they? Uh, they are currently in eighth grade. Wow. Twins or? Uh, they're triplets. Actually. Triplets, triplets. Wow. <laughs> that is so cool. Okay. So we have the logo, which is very important when you're starting your business. And, and definitely you have to have a logo when you're creating a website for your company around your product. So we see the logo and then we see this picture here of all of you. Yes, this right. is a picture of our team and a little bio about us. Um, and if you keep scrolling down, there should be a button about our product that you can, that will transfer you to the page about it. And then a contact us portion of the page. Okay. And where is, where is the actual, dis oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is what you were talking about. So there's a button called our product. And now we see the hydrothermal hat. So explain exactly what we're looking at here because I see several different pictures yes, of the hat is, itself and how how exactly is it designed does this fit inside of another hat that you have or do you just take this device as it is and place it on top of your head how does it work this is a diagram of the electronic component of our product okay and um, you can see pictures four and five that is the device that we were thinking of placing into the hat and um, making it smaller or bigger depending on future wearable devices that we make okay and the top two pictures are the solar powered version of the device that we included in our patent okay so again Omina do, do you so if I'm looking at pictures one and two, and, and for those of you who are only listening to the podcast and you don't have the benefit of seeing the video right now, it looks like a, almost like a disc with these two little solar panels on top. And so explain to us how this works. So if a person is outside, let's say there's a person outside doing some landscaping work and it's, it's 
in the middle of the summer, it's July. How, how does that person who's actually outside doing landscaping work, who's wearing this, this hydrothermal hat, how will this person know that he or she is potentially in danger of maybe becoming overheated? And at, at worst case scenario, on the verge of maybe even potentially suffering from a heat stroke. So the device that you see here has multiple sensors in it that um, we combine the data from to then determine and keep track of the person's likelihood of heat stress or heat stroke. And with that data, we, um, we can warn the user once they reach the set limit, depending on their date, on their own personal information, like height, age. Um, so then they can be notified if they've, if their temperature has reached a certain point that it will become dangerous for them and they're likely to go into heat stress and they need to um, stop working for a bit, drink water, go in the shade, try and cool themselves down. Um, and it, that's um, basically the process of how the device would work. So is there software that comes with this also? Yes, we, um, we not only patented the hardware, but also the software that handles the um, data that it receives from the sensors and what the user sees. Okay, so there's, there's the actual physical tangible product. And then there's software. So is it that a person who potentially will purchase this hat, that person would also then download the software or maybe even go to your website at some point and be able to enter in information such as age, height, weight, things like that? Is that how that yeah. works? Okay. So almost mm -hmm. like the way a Fitbit would work from what I understand. Okay, this wearable technology. Now, how, how, is, is, how are these, these alerts and notifications actually communicated to the person who's wearing the hat? Um, when we were brainstorming this process and looking into how the software would work, we were thinking of making an app to go along with the product so okay. that they would receive notifications through that app. Ah, okay. That makes sense. So that person would potentially have the phone near them, maybe in, a, in their mm -hmm. pocket or something like that, and they would receive a notification or, or some type of an alert that would pop up mm -hmm. on the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I don't want to, you know, potentially ask you, any of you to talk about something that, that might divulge too much information about your technology, but can you explain to us a little bit more about these sensors and how they work? Um, well, the sensors that are included in the device are a thermometer, a pulse meter, and an accelerometer. And the thermometer monitors the user's temperature, the pulse meter, the, per, um, the user's pulse, and then the accelerometer actually measures the elevation. And the reasoning behind the sensor is the threat of someone fainting. And yes. the accelerometer would be able to determine whether by change of elevation, whether a person has fainted. And of course, we also took into account maybe someone is um, going down to pick something up or they, um, they're doing physical labor. So they're carrying stuff around and um, going up or down stairs. Um, so we made sure to take that into account when um, thinking of the software. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to show share something with all of you really quickly. This was something that my husband had. It, it's it's a piece of uh, terry cloth made in the shape of a. <laughs> A hat. So when I found out about your hydrothermal hat, I was thinking, okay, he definitely needs that because this is what he wears when he goes outside and does yard work. And so it's a far cry from what you all have invented. But the, the reason he put this on was so that it could absorb the sweat and to help keep his body cool. And the reason he decided to, to make it out of terry cloth is because you know how most robes are made out of terry cloth. And after you take a shower, 
you know, you can just put that terry that that robe on, and a lot of times it just kind of soaks up any additional moisture that may still be on your body. So he used that same philosophy or concept to to make this. <laughs> this floppy little hat here. So I will definitely be letting him know about your hydrothermal hat. He might be one of your very first customers. So let's, if you all could actually start to talk us through, us who are listening to this and watching this right now, talk us through the moment you you conceived this idea. And then once you have that idea, obviously you have to create some type of a prototype to test the science and, and crunch the numbers and, and then actually file for patent protection. So can you, can you start to walk us through what that process was like? Who'd like to talk about that? Or, or... Uh, sure, I can talk about that. Okay, and that's, this um, is Alex, everyone. Yes, I'm Alex. Um, and just to clarify, you're asking about the history, basically yes. of how- Yes, how did be? this come to be? Correct. Okay, so- about almost two years ago, um, we were meeting up as a group. Uh, Miss Nath kind of sent out like um, somewhat of an advertisement to making like a new product or making a some sort of project for uh, the Lemelson MIT grant. And that grant, I we were trying to brainstorm ideas for it. And we were thinking about what... Uh, what was a problem in our area. And since we live in Arizona, we decided that heat was pretty much the most prevalent issue. And then we decided to brainstorm different ways that we can combat the heat. And through that, it kind of evolved into preventing uh, heat related illnesses. But our original idea was dehydration. So it went mm. from dehydration to heat related illnesses uh, and prevention. So then we decided to research um, scientific concepts uh, such as evaporative cooling and how to sense heat illnesses before they actually happen. So we decided that having some sort of wearable device that a user can wear with a sensor on it uh, would be the best way to uh, prevent those illnesses from happening. So we applied for the grant. Unfortunately, we made it to the top 30, but then they were picking the top 15 to get the grant and we weren't selected. However, uh, we did continue to, with the project awesome. and we were developing the pretty much how it would work. And as was explained earlier, that pretty much evolved over time uh, to the point it is now. And we began patenting it uh, about six months ago, I believe. And okay. no, we applied for a preliminary patent, if I remember correctly, way back in August or July of 2019. Okay. But then we hired lawyers to help us with the finalizing uh, of the patent approximately six months ago. And do you remember what type of patent application? Because for those for those who are listening and watching, and they, they may not realize this, but I know there are utility patents and then there are the design patents. So did you file both? Um, it, it was just a utility patent okay. for now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Now, can you, so you have this idea, you apply for the grant, didn't get selected for the grant, but you decided that this was an idea still worth pursuing. So what happened next? Who actually came up with the design? Because I'm sure I remember someone saying that they, they're the, the number cruncher. Was that Jacob saying that? Yeah, Jacob, I believe you were saying you, you crunched the numbers and, and Daniel, you're into the electronics. So can, can both of you talk us through how you came up with the design or did you come up with the design and or did someone else come up with the design and then the, the two of you maybe did the number crunching behind it and actually embedded the electronic component of the hat? How did that, how did that did, work? How did these superpowers come together? Well, I did the number crunching. Uh, the design was primarily between Daniel and Neilan. Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, Neilan and I, we, we just made uh, 
like a very basic electronics. Uh, it has all the functions of the hat, but it's not in the shape of a hat. Okay. Uh, we used uh, Arduino for the electronics just to make sure. Uh, well, as a, I don't even know if you would call it a prototype, but along those lines. Okay. Just to, to see that it, to make sure that it would work, right? That was the most important thing. And Neelan, did you, did you want to say anything about your contribution to the design and, and the electronic piece? Yeah, so we also use 3D modeling software to come up with a general design and where things would go on the hat and stuff like that. Okay, so you, you, you come up with this design, you test it out just to make sure that the sensors work properly. And then did you decide to actually file for a patent application or did you form your business first? In what order did that happen? Who wants to, who wants to speak to that? Oh, I can, so I'm Caitlin. Okay. So uh, first we applied for the preliminary patent and then as we started working more on it, we began filing for, I guess, the next patent. And at the same time, we also formed our business and Hydro LLC at the same time. Okay. So you formed the business. Now, can we actually walk through, if, if I, could you recommend a website that I go to next to talk about how, to, how you actually filed your patent application? Should we go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's website? Would, would you all be able to talk us through that? Because there may yes. be people who are listening or watching this right now who have no idea where to even begin. So, uh, Alicia, uh, this is Rachna again. I, I will, I'll actually want to add a few things before we go to the next stage because... Okay, sure. Daniel, yeah, Daniel and Neelan, they are too humble to actually <laughs> say... Oh, what sure, they I'm sure. Did. I mean, they're, they're very quiet and... <laughs> Um, but they did go through uh, a training for SolidWorks, which is a 3D software, 3D designing software. And using the 3D designing software, which is SolidWorks, they actually came up with a pretty good idea of what the 3D renderings of a hat would feel like. So the, di the diagrams that you saw on the website, yes. they're just the 3D renderings from the SolidWorks software. So it's not the actual hat but it's something that looks like a dome, but it's supposed to be the hat and that's where the sensors are, will, will, will be. And using Bluetooth, the sensors will be communicating with that app in the phone um, that's gonna give you all the alerts and the warnings. So, okay. and uh, this, all of this was designed and thought of by them. So they are very minimal in saying what they- Yes, what they yes, I can tell because I'm like, I know there's a lot of work that you all have put into this, but they're being very humble about it. Very um, humble. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, um, uh, I think Pat, the, the, uh, Caitlin and anybody who else did the research and background, they can talk about um, the patent process itself. We did hire, uh, well, uh, not hire, hire, when uh, I, got in touch with a group of friends and they'll talk about Chandler Innovations and how we ended up with uh, the friend who ended up helping us with the application. So, um, but I'll have them talk about it. Okay. So while we were researching for our project, I mainly used Google patents to look up very similar products that were similar to our invention. Okay. So let me, let me pull that up really quickly, Caitlin, so that we can take a look at what that would possibly look like. So Google patents. You guys are teaching me something new. I didn't know about this. So I'm going to click here. And then then what did you do next? Yeah, so I just typed in some keywords that were related to our product, such as like a cooling hat. Okay. Ah, and so it, it's literally searching the web, the World Wide Web, to see if there are any patents that have to do with a cooling hat. Is that how this works? Yes. Okay. Oh, look yeah, at that. and I would, yeah, and I would just go through the website and just sort of like read up on any products that were similar to ours and how ours would be different Very and how we could improve our invention as well. Yes. So, I mean. I'm sure you must have come up with how many how many uh, res how many patents came up in your in your search results. I would imagine there would would have been several 
Did you go through each of those or did you use a divide and conquer strategy where you looked at all of them and told the rest of your your teammates or your business partners, hey, I'm going to look at the first 10, you look at the next 10. How did that how did that work? Yeah, so I just mainly looked at the first couple of pages and I also worked with Dia on this as well. So she can also add to um, how we researched all these different patents. Okay. Hi, so I'm Dia Math. And uh, like Caitlin said, we both worked on this. And basically what we uh, did was both um, look through a few patents and um, basically compare ours and how ours was better than theirs, which is um, key to um, why people would buy our product. Because if, um, if ours is like not better then they will, then why would they buy our product? So that's something we really focused on is um, looking at um, other cooling hats and comparing them to ours, um, comparing them to our invention and saying why ours is better and why you should buy ours. And so that was basically a part of our background research, competitive technologies. Okay. Okay, and so once you realized what your, I guess what we would call in the business world, what your competitive advantage or your key differentiating factor was or is, did you then discuss that with the rest of the team and then collectively you all decided to pursue patent protection? Yes, of course. Um, uh, We just talked to our team and see how we could improve our product and how we can adapt it um, for our competition. In, at the beginning of the, pro- of, the, of the project, we were planning on, on applying for a patent. Okay. So you realize what makes your, your cooling hat different and better, to your point. And so then did you, did you then go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to actually file or begin the, the process of filing your patent application? What was what was your next step? Um, actually, uh, so Hani and I worked on that as well, and I think we um, looked at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office as well. For our okay, research. so let's let's go to that website. I think it's USPTO.gov. I believe is the site. I'm going off of memory here. Okay, yes, that's it. And so did you, it sounds like you all filed, was it a provisional patent application? I always get confused over provisional and non-provisional. So is it provisional that you file first when just to bide yourselves enough time before you submit the real patent application? Yes, exactly. So, oh, I'm the, so high, by the way. So um, <laughs> basically um, you file a provisional first. So we filed that back in, I believe, August, 2019. Okay. And that basically gives you a year to research um, and really look into the project and see if it's actually worth filing a non-provisional or a non-provisional for. Um, so after a year of research, we uh, went ahead and filed for the non-provisional. And that's basically like the permanent patent that everyone thinks of when they say patent. That's like the permanent um, thing that extends for years and years and years. Um, so yeah, we once you file the, um, the, the non-provisional is much more complex than the actual provisional, mm-hmm. uh, the provisional patent. Um, the provisional patent is mainly just like a basic summary of what you want to um, research in the next year. It has basic details, not really in depth, a couple of diagrams, not many. But when you get into the actual non-provisional patent, uh, the, the detail um, it increases tenfold. Um, so you have pages and pages of just different embodiments that you'd have to possibly uh, look into or different details, different, like all the different parts, uh, multiple different diagrams um, and other parts of the application that makes it much more complex. Um, so the provisional is always suggested beforehand, just so you can research the project and actually make sure you want to spend um, more time and more money on the actual um, non-provisional, since the non-provisional is, uh, costs much more and it takes much more time. Now, I think I re- remember, Rachna, you were saying that you all did enlist the counsel of an actual patent attorney in preparing for the, the non-provisional application. Is that correct? 
Um, absolutely, you're right, Alicia. So um, I'll do a quick uh, round off of what we did. Um, when we ended up figuring out what we're going to work on relating to heat stress, um, I invited all the parents over of all of these um, students and said, hey, this is something that the students have been doing uh, background research on. Looks like there is no other product available in the market. So uh, before we even go and start talking about this with other people, I would want the idea protected. So we filed a provisional application. The provisional application is just a placeholder that um, if there is a competitor uh, that is filing at the same date, if we file a little bit early, then the patent becomes ours. So it's a placeholder. So that placeholder gives us that um, freedom to not just talk research and look more into the product that we want to do, but also gives us a one year time frame uh, so that we can sort out all the kings, build prototypes, do whatever we want with it. Um, and then um, also reach out to the public for funding, uh, resources that we can get, uh, but still have the idea protected because once it gets into the public, um, it, it's, it's difficult not to get quickly replicated, uh, especially with big companies that can quickly do something like that. Sure. And for me, I always wanted the ideas of my students protected. So, I, so we ended up filing a provisional patent quickly. And then um, after that, we ended up reaching out to uh, potential customers that could be potentially using the Hydra hat. So the students uh, went ahead and talked to old age homes, hikers, community workers, construction workers, and talked about what they are doing at this point to reduce their heat stress versus what if what will they be doing or will they even be interested in buying uh, a hydro head that is probably going to cost like $40, $50. Um, and that was just uh, you know, a wild uh, guess as to how much it's going to cost, but again, just needed some d data on it. Sure. So the, 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 the consumer's feedback was very important as to how um, and what they going, they're going to do. And also the bulkiness of the prototype versus you know, the effectiveness of the prototype. Is there a demand in the market for such a, a device? That's what they all sorted it out. Um, so the groups were all divided into one of them was some groups were doing background research on, is there something available like that? Some of them are thinking about potential ways to make it more unique. Um, and a group of people were working on the marketing strategies. Jacob was there figuring out, oh my God, I'm going to be out of budget right now. So <laughs> we don't have any money. So <laughs> versus, uh, And again, the whole thing came together in a way. And we had um, mentors who actually came and helped us too. One of the mentors who is a very close friend of mine. He is the head of cybersecurity in, in Residio right now, Dr. Raj, Rajagopalan. So uh, he came and mentored the kids. Uh, there were other um, friends who mentored the kids, like the, the, um, uh, um, his name is Atmanathan, Atam Atmanathan. He is actually one of, um, he's a dad of one of my students who was also in this group, but unfortunately she moved out to another school, but he works in microchips. So I had him, um, Dr. Jeff LaBelle, who is a renowned scientist and a renowned innovator. Um, he used to be at ASU, now he's in Grand Canyon University. So all of these people actually came and talked to these students about the ideas, awesome. the potential. Yeah, so I made that possible so that the students not just have an idea and work off of their own, but there are some people, and I'm a biologist, and I have very limited knowledge on electronics and electronic-based products, but I made sure that they had some kind of a fallback um, person into so that they can help. I, I called in for people in Intel who could do an NDA, like non-disclosure agreement and come and help with that because as I mean, some people flatly refuse. Sorry, I'm not going to do an NDA. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Then really? I will. Yeah. yeah. And I said, wow. oh, I mean, and just giving the idea, they were like, oh, this is very open source. Anybody can do it. I'm like, yeah, I understand. But this is something that I want the kids to have it. You know, even though I'm a part of the patent, I have written off of any financial benefits that the kids are going to get from it. And that's how I work. And I would not let anybody else take that from them. And then I said, sorry, if you don't send an NDA, I, that's, it's, I won't be able to tell you well, more about the product. So. Well, I'll tell you, that's a really important business lesson to learn very early on is getting those non-disclosure agreements in place, getting those non-compete agreements in place as well. Because anytime people start to 
to to show that they don't they're not comfortable or they're just flat out refuse to sign those types of agreements. That's very telling. Right. So, right. Um, so that's a great mm-hmm. lesson to learn up front. And, and this is actually a great segue into the next question that I want to ask all of you. So we've been talking about this process from ideation to actual product, product, product prototyping, excuse me, and then on to filing your actual patent application. Now, you've, you're walking us through this process, and that's just one element of what I call business infrastructure. Does, in, does anyone want to take a crack at what business infrastructure actually is? since you're all entrepreneurs also. Anybody wanna take a guess? Don't all raise your hand at once. (laughs) Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, and for those of you who are listening, if you're listening to this show for the first time, business infrastructure is a system for how you link your people, your processes, and your tools together so that growth can happen in a profitable and sustainable way. So again, we've been talking about the process that you all have been going through, but I want to also talk about the people component and the the tools and the technologies. And you've already touched on several things as it relates to both of those elements in particular, but I want to spend a little bit more time on each of them. For that people component, I did ask each of you at the beginning of the episode what your superpower is. And I can already, as you've walked me through the process, I can already tell how each of you probably contributed your individual superpowers to actually walking through this process. But I'd like for each of you, maybe in just a minute, maybe two minutes at the most, to to talk about what your specific contribution is and, and will continue to be as you all develop an actual product that can be sold on the market. So Sahani, we can start with you again. So for me, I basically dabbled in almost every aspect of the project, to be honest. Um, So in the research, I helped with that aspect, trying to find um, different um, things we could do with the product or ways we can make it unique. Um, I also dabbled in um, making sure that we stayed in the budget, though Jacob did most of the budget work. I made sure that we were staying on top of that work. Um, When it came to outreach, I helped... Uh, many different individuals, um, uh, Amina mainly, um, find um, different other individuals to um, contact, and I helped her um, basically compile everything. And I basically helped with the whole um, grant application as a whole, making sure everyone's um, contributing and staying on track. Um, and as an administrator, I'm uh, an administrator on the team along with Abe and Alex. I basically kept everyone um, focused and keeping them, um, like, um, making sure that they were working uh, throughout the whole process, making sure they were um, keyed in on everything that's happening within the group, making sure everything's organized and all of that sorts. Um, we did have times in which, you know, we were all distracted and, you know, we were all having fun. Fun is very important, but when it comes to actually getting things done by the deadlines, I made sure that that happened. So. Awesome. And what about you, Alex? Yeah. So I was also a part of administration, as Sohani said. Uh, I worked with uh, the whole group pretty much to make sure that like everything was uh, going as it as it should have been. So for example, like if there was a document or a grant that needed to be filled out, I would help out with that. And then like at the end, I would make sure that like everything's there. And like if something wasn't, I'd be like, hey, come on, let's uh, we, we need to get it. Or like I try to get it in first or I ask other people for help to get it in. Um, but I would say overall, the overarching, my overarching role is pretty much just administration and kind of like learning along the way how different things work. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And what about you, Caitlin? Yeah, so my role on this team was mainly researching patents as well as competitive products and competitive, yes, products throughout the market. And I guess my role would also apply once we finish the prototype and start selling it as well in the future. I guess being on the lookout for those competitive products we see in the stores and how we can advertise our product better and how we can improve it and and adapt it to the changing times. That's awesome because uh, there's always going to be competition. So it's, it's great that you're doing that kind of research. And what about you, Abe? Uh, I was also part of the administration team um, but I also made one of the early logo designs for our uh, company that wasn't 
it's not used uh, as of right now. And uh, I also remember I helped with a lot of some of the research that was put into uh, making the grant. And I remember we uh, uh, organized into like different sections where we each kind of participated uh, and to make the grant. Uh, we all edited each other. We basically went in, wrote our section, and then helped edit other uh, sections together. So awesome. And Amina, how about you? Um, during the patent process, I was part of, I was the outreach person. So I was helping the SNAF um, get in contact with people that we could help with our product and that they could help with giving us feedback on what we can do better and their input on what they would look for in our product if they were to get it. Um, and I made sure we kept track of all the people that we did outreach with, contact information. Um, I was the one that was annoying the rest of the team. I need your pictures. <laughs> I need a bio, a title. Tell me what you want um, with the website. And as we continue with the company and going into um, selling the product, I will go more into social media marketing and I would make sure that our name stays out there, everyone knows what we're doing, and also help promote different um, products that might come up in the future and um, just having our um, place in social media. Awesome, and that is so important to have that social media presence and the fact that you're building that already before the product is out, it, it kind of helps to build up that anticipation. And that way, once your product is actually launched, you're going to already have this, this community of raving fans who've been eagerly anticipating the release and the launch of, of the products. So that's, that's fantastic. Dia, what about you? Um, hi, so this is Dia. And I, I'm basically a researcher mainly um, and contributing to research with Caitlin and studying different uh, competitive technologies in the market. And um, we also looked at like weight when we started our, uh, when we started uh, this uh, patent process, um, me and Caitlin basically looked at what heat stroke was and um, all that foundation knowledge that we had to know. And we also looked at um, extra data, like how many deaths were, um, um, so how many deaths um, due, were due to heat stroke in this area compared to like um, other natural disasters and things like that. So we would uh, research um, things like that to back up why our um, product, why our, um, why the address, addressing this problem is very important and then um, tie that into like uh, our product and why we came up with it. And that's important too, because that's a lot of times what you'll, you'll hear marketers talk about is understanding your why. In other words, what's the purpose and the reasoning and the rationale behind your products. So that's, that's really important to have that, to know your why and to know the story behind your why. Jacob? How about you? Uh, well, I was in charge of financials, like when we originally filed for our uh, the MIT grant, when we started our project, I was in charge of making the budget and like managing our, the grant was like $10,000 and splitting it between like however many categories for like supplies for electronics and office and storage. Mm -hmm. And so, after that, when that fell through, I would, uh, did work on fundraising money and for the club and creating an account. So we kind of like merged our project into a school club called Research Club. So we could uh, get money through like tax donations and stuff. Oh, that's and then awesome. For fundraising, yeah. And then for fundraising, uh, one time we planned for it to be at a school soccer game and sell concessions to make money for our group. So currently I'm in charge of, uh, the account for the project and raising money to do stuff. So you know all too well that you can have the best product in the world, but if you don't have the money to get it out there, to get it developed and, and marketed and the business of being in, of, of having that product, uh, it's, 
it's just not going to happen. So again, another great lesson to learn very early on. Yeah, we Alicia, applied- I want I want to add I want to add something to what Jacob did. It's a really funny story. So um, I don't I don't know if he remembers it because our total grant budget was around ten thousand um, dollars, mm-hmm. and then we had to account for all the ten thousand dollars, and he could not come up <laughs> with what we are going to need for ten thousand dollars. And I said, think again. <laughs> it's going to fly yeah, away. It can because, go very quickly. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and that made me uh, realize that, oh, my God, these are high school kids who have <laughs> never, ever dealt with money like that. And $10,000 is a big sum for them. Mm-hmm. And he, he, I think, came up with, I mean, somehow he came up with $5,000. And I'm like, no, Jacob, we need $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that, Jacob? Yeah. And, he's and like, I think the funny thing is looking back now, $10,000 doesn't seem like a whole lot, even though it was a lot back then. <laughs> and, and, and now they, it's like, we need were, more money. Yeah, and they were arguing with me. Mrs. Matt, I just, we just need to bring, by one sensor of, uh, I mean, a pulse meter, one of this and one of that, and I think we should be done with the prototype. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, we need a lot more. <laughs> So they have learned a lot. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yes. So when you look at some of these websites, these crowdfunding websites, for example, like Kickstarter or GoFundMe, if you look at other technologies that are trying to raise money, you can see they're they're asking for a lot more than $10,000, right? Um, And that money can go very, very, very quickly. So Daniel, let's move on to you. Uh, so basically, again, I worked on the electronics and the software of mm-hmm. our well, prototype circuitry, uh, like the, making sure that the, the pulse meter actually works and we can tell how uh, heart rate. Uh, and in the future, uh, uh, once we actually get a prototype, including like the hat frame, I will uh, I'll work on improving and, uh, let's say, optimizing the software and the circuitry. And I'm, I'm sure you also played a significant role in letting Jacob know what the numbers needed to be in terms of, you yeah. know, if there, yes, yes. So, it, you know, there's, there's those, there are those design and development costs and that, that again could easily take up all of the $10,000 I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. So Neilan, what about you? Uh, so, I pretty much worked on the same things that Daniel did. So, we did a lot of the software and hardware, as well as the 3D modeling to get an overall idea of what should go where and how they should connect to each other. And we worked together a lot on the Arduino aspects with the hardware, figuring out uh, how things should work in the right way. And we also had to communicate to Jacob what parts we were going to get and what price they were. And it was changing a lot. So we always had to update him on her status. Yes, yes, yes. So there, there's that communication piece again. Have You have different people doing different things all at the same time. And you have to make sure that you're always on the same page. So Neilan, if we could, if we could uh, continue on to the next question with you. So we talked about process, we talked about the people. So let's talk a little bit, and I know we're running out of time here, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to talk about those different tools and technologies that you all used throughout this entire process. So one of the things I have here that you mentioned was the 3D modeling software that you all use. What's the name of that again? So we used uh, SolidWorks for our okay. 3D modeling software. We were there... had to get a license for that software. Okay. And were there any other tools that you all used? Um, we used the Arduino IDE for our coding software in order to that's the our best optimization the best optimization we have for using Arduino hardware as well and we also use the app 
on our phone for communicating with our uh, for testing our heat sensors and all the devices that we use in our technology. And that's how we were able to come up with our earliest test data. And that's about it. And what, what was the name of that app? Uh, it's just the Arduino app. I don't remember that what it's called. I think it's Arduino Remote or something like that. And how is that it's spelled? An app by Arduino. Okay. How is that Arduino spelled? Arduino is spelled A R D U I N O. Okay. Okay. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes because there may be some people who would be interested in taking a look into that. They may have a product and, and may not be familiar with this application. What other tools did you all use? I would imagine, Jacob, that you, you were using Microsoft Excel or were you using some other type of application to track the numbers? Uh, I think I was using Google Slide. I mean, Google Sheets. Okay. To track the numbers. That okay. way you could more easily collaborate. Correct. I get it. Yes, yes. And where are you, where were you all storing all of your documentation? Are you storing that in the cloud? Are you using something like a Dropbox to keep all of your patents? We have a, yeah, we have a, like a, a shared Google Drive. Okay. Files where we keep our stuff. Mm hmm. Okay. Any other technologies or tools that anyone else was using? I know you. I've, I've heard social media. Uh, anything else? We talked about the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website. I know you're using Weebly to design your website. Is there any other? Is there any other technology that you were using, or any other type of tool that you've been using throughout this entire process that anyone can think of? Uh, I don't know if this would really count, but we, I know we used, uh, to stay, uh, in touch with what everybody was doing and, uh, keep on communicating. We used WhatsApp, uh, just yeah. like a group text, uh, make sure everybody's up to date on what everybody's doing. Yes. Yes. Are you all familiar with Slack? That might be a really great one for you all to look into. Also check out Slack. It's a free app and it allows you to to organize all of your communications into different channels or threads. So, so take a look at that because it's a, it's a phone-based as well as a web-based app. And many people that have been on my podcast have all talked about how instrumental Slack has been in helping them keep up with communications. And it also allows you to attach files. You can even make phone calls through Slack. So might just be another tool for you to look into. Well, I'm so sorry that our time is is uh, Discord. Yes, Dia mentioned Discord. I have a love hate relationship, Dia, with Discord. <laughs> so Discord is for gamers, um, and I'll tell a really quick story. I had to MC a conference a couple of months ago, and that was the way that was the way we communicated with each other behind the scenes. So all of the producers of this conference, this was the way they wanted to communicate. Discord, as I understand it, is for gamers, and it does not play very friendly with PCs. So I had a very difficult time downloading Discord to my PC, and I eventually figured it out. But um, it is it is cool. It is a it is a cool tool, and it it is very much like Slack in that sense that you can organize your communications into different channels. So. What's next for you all? I know that you are waiting for this patent to be approved. And then what's what's next? What's on the horizon for Sense Hydro? Um, so a while back we took this uh we took this class called Chandler Innovations. I know this was briefly touched on, and we talked about a little bit about uh our future and how we eventually planned on um manufacturing. And I remember we wrote down all of our uh, potential parts that we would need to order and how much that would cost to mass produce it. Uh, and we also needed to consider which manufacturers we would go through. Uh, so that was one important part about considering potentially making this a product that could be sold in stores or online. Okay. So what's the best way? I'm sorry. Did someone else, did you want to say something, Sahani? Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add. Um, so 
investment. That's basically a long a long term goal to basically get it um into a uh, market into the market um but at the moment what we're working on is our prototype i'm sure you already know um, so we are almost done with actually our first prototype and we're planning on creating around 65 um uh, versions of that prototype and we will then wow. uh, test that over the summer i believe this summer um, with athletes from our school district uh, to make sure that our idea actually um, in that format will work um, so once we test that, we're hoping on um, adapting the patent in any way possible and uh, eventually getting that to market as soon as six months. Um, in order to do that, we also actually have um, a grant that we got from um, the Healthy Ur Urban Environment Initiative um, in association with the ASU um, Julianne Wrigley Sustainability um, organization and we basically got a fifty thousand dollar grant from them um, which we oh, are using awesome. right now uh, to develop our patent and to test it in the summer so um, they're really helping us with everything that's going on right now as well with the testing and everything and once we actually get the data from our experiments we'll actually also be able to have a publication in an, a journal um, in association with asu so that's what's coming up um, real soon um, but eventually we're hoping that we do get it into market wow so how so, can we, yes, I'm sorry, if I may, If I may add something, Alicia, this is Rachna again. And uh, one thing that I really have to mention uh, about these kids is that we did not end up getting a $10,000 grant from MIT, but we ended up getting a $50,000 grant right. through the Maricopa Community Health <laughs> Services. And that is, and um, the grant came through um, a lady who actually happened to read an article on uh, AZ15 News about the Hydra Hat. So they did get the publicity a lot about being in an MIT program, but someone else picked it up, invited us over for a conference, and then we ended up applying for a grant for 50000 We also ended up getting the Intel 4440 grant um, and a couple of other things that we were writing for, but... Uh, Again, hats off to these students for, you know, rising up tall yes. from yes. Uh, the struggles that they had. The, I mean, it was a huge disappointment not getting that MIT grant, but then they continued to try. If they continued to rise, they continued to persevere. So, And that is the spirit of a true entrepreneur. Yes. You know, you're down, but you're never out. So congratulations to all of you. This is so impressive. I'm so proud of all of you. And I love that you each, again, we talked about your superpowers and how you're bringing your superpowers together collectively to create something that is definitely needed. So what is the best way for people to keep in touch with what Sense Hydro has going on? Is, is it going to the website? Do you have some type of a, a list that you're starting to collect so that you can keep in touch with people and we can stay abreast of any new developments from your company? Yes, so this is Alex again. Um, but we will be, we're uh, pretty much gonna try to be more active on social media such as Instagram. Okay. And we will be updating our website uh, frequently to be able to kind of keep customers updated with what's going on. Okay, awesome. Now, if I'm going off of memory here, but I remember on the website, there was a form that you could fill out. So if I were to fill out that form, would, that, would I get added to a list of some sort? That would go to our, that would go to our business email Okay. That uh, we exclusively use. I am not sure at the moment whether we have like a list that we have like subscription, like you get notified for what's going on with our company. I don't mm -hmm. believe we have one of those, but it would be beneficial to implement that in the future. And as for our Instagram, um, I, I, I would like to plug it. It's the name of our company. It's Sense Hydro. Okay. So you can follow that on Insta on Instagram. Okay. If you'd like. And our Twitter, I believe, same thing. Okay. So Instagram but, and Twitter, the handle is at Sense Hydro, and that's S E N S E H Y D R O, right? Yes. Okay. 
All right. Well, Sohani, Alex, Caitlin, Abe, Amina, Dia, Jacob, Daniel, Nate, Neelan, Rachna, thank you all so much for coming on to this show and for allowing yourselves to be vulnerable, which is so important. And I think many people who will watch this, because I'm sure that most people who will see this will be older, but they'll think to themselves, wow, if these 10th and 11th graders can do this, then what on earth am I waiting on? So thank you for walking us through your process, how you came up with this idea, even though you applied for that original grant for $10,000, you you know, you didn't win it, but you didn't let that stop you. You definitely didn't let it deter you. And now look at what's happened. You filed for a patent, an actual non-provisional patent, and now you've been awarded this $50,000 grant. And I know there's so many more good things to come your way. So if there's anything that I can do to continue to support and spread the word, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Let's recap the process for legally protecting your idea. First, formalize your idea by writing it down on paper. Next, search for any competing patents. Doing that one step alone will go a long way as you prepare for step three, which is seeking counsel from a patent attorney. After that, you want to make sure you seek mentors with different areas of expertise and ask if they can serve on your advisory board. Next, Understand, based on the counsel you've sought from your attorney as well as your mentors, whether patent protection is really the route that you should take. Next, consider filing a provisional patent application if you need more time to flesh out your idea. If not, then go ahead to step number seven, which is filing a non-provisional patent application once you're ready for actual legal protection. Next, Think about everyone's superpower on your team and delegate responsibilities accordingly. Make sure you hold each other accountable by setting timelines and being realistic about expectations. And last and probably most important in all of this is making sure you get those non-disclosure agreements signed. People will steal ideas. Yes, even from children. Sad, but true. Let's all get a quick smile here because I am going to have a screenshot so that we know for our cover artwork for this podcast. So one, two, three, just a quick smile. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you all so much again. And um, we, I look forward to having you all back on the show so that we can make sure we check in on your progress and see what's, what's happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. Appreciate that. Victor Hugo said, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Well, the time is definitely now for Sense Hydro and their Hydro Hat. With the number of heat-related deaths continuously rising, the sooner their product is available on the market, the better. And rest assured, my husband and I will be some of their first customers. I wonder how soon Sense Hydro's patent will be awarded. What product will they develop next? Or will they develop the phone app next? Maybe they'll develop them simultaneously. Hmm, I wonder. What do you think? There's only one way to find out. Head on over to businessinfrastructure.tv where you can find out how to follow Sense Hydro's progress as well as access links to the resources they shared. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to this podcast and to our YouTube channel. Again, that's businessinfrastructure.tv. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and for being a loyal subscriber. Remember, stay focused, be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. <laughs>